Welcome, everyone. We're going to get started here in about 15 seconds. We see a few stragglers trying to establish a video connection. Great. And if you're around your conference table waiting for some other team members to arrive, there'll be a just a a uh, slight preamble here before we get down into what really matters, the data that Lee's going to present. I am Mike O'Connor. I'm the head of marketing at New Voodoo. I'm with uh, the head of research, uh, Lee Jacobs. He handles perceptuals and call out, uh, our version of call out and uh, other sorts of music testing for clients. And I handle all the digital direct mail telemarketing uh, uh, for the company uh, with the team. Welcome to our latest in the new voodoo ongoing webinar series in the next 30 minutes we're going to share fresh data from what is now our 12th semi-annual ratings prospect study and this is uh, our way of reaching out to you, our friends in the industry to help you keep up with changing trends learn what radio listeners really honestly think with the most update to date data we can possibly uh, deliver so we'll pass along a new trick or true to help you leverage some of these findings as we get ready to direct listening in your station's favor uh, during the all-important uh, sweeps period. We'll start today by uh, broadly covering the preferences of radio listeners in general, but <clears throat> what's made us famous and what we set out to do when we established New Voodoo about a decade ago, when we were corporate radio executives with the ratings pressure on our backs, is to drill down into the subset of listeners who either have participated or kind of fit our model for likely participation as either panelists or diary keepers in the radio ratings. And uh, we've got a new metric uh, to share with you today, uh, what is our new voodoo gold standard of uh, listener. And as I mentioned, uh, I lead a team that uh, is in charge with really aggressively defending, expanding audience share of our clients. So we're absolutely dependent on these semi-annual studies so that we can optimize the mix of advertising, marketing channels uh, for maximum ratings impact. We're playing a game here. And of course, because we don't get too many phone calls from clients who have exciting news about massive increases in marketing budgets, um, we do rely on this data also to make tough decisions about how to best allocate precious ad dollars. And so that's why we do these studies a couple of times every year. Today's ratings prospect study was fielded uh, really less than 30 days ago. We, we finished up uh, actually just as June was ending. And uh, this updates our findings from our January study about what marketing channel survey friendly listeners pay attention to. If you're with us in the spring, you'll recall that direct mail was in the top three, but it slipped a little in the younger demo. So let's see if that still is the case. 14 to 24 s have largely figured out how to deal with the business of everyday life on their smartphones. So we're thinking, while direct mail is a powerful weapon above the age of 25 as of our last study, not so uh, much under that. And let's see if that demo has shifted at all in the last six months. Outdoor, a very popular channel and one that our research suggest, has suggested in the past has been a top four marketing channel. Down in rank a little bit, and we think that's directly proportional to the, um, the mobile phone penetration, which has become ubiquitous and the amount of time spent on mobile which really continues to climb every time we do one of these studies. We'll also look at website and social media ads. They rounded out the top three in the past, but in terms of which channels are likely um, to impact ratings respondents and ones that uh, they use often enough so that you can make and deliver enough message frequency and quality to move the needle, that is constantly changing, a moving target and a big part of why we do these studies so frequently. And um, how much has perennial new voodoo research study, digital champion, I don't know how to put it, ruler of all things digital, at least in the past, Facebook, how much have they been impacted by the Cambridge Analytica data scandal, the data privacy issues? It's been a while since uh, Facebook uh, made you culpa and uh, stood before Congress and British Parliament facing uh, scrutiny. So let's see what the impact and trust and behavior has been for Facebook. Facebook's wholly owned subsidiary Instagram has been fending off an attack by an upstart Snapchat, largely following a strategy of uh, blocking uh, by dulling any differences, stealing Instagram's unique selling propositions such as stories 
So let's find out if that's worked out as they've hoped and see if the Facebook Instagram one-two punch is still the one to emphasize uh, when uh, allocating ad dollars. And uh, <clears throat> speaking of ad dollars, the Google video, a Google and YouTube ecosystem has probably undergone more fundamental change in the last six months than any ad platform. There are now four ways to buy video on the Google ecosystem from multiple SKUs of YouTube TrueView, some of which are still in beta, to um, brand new bumper videos, which have been out for a while, we use them all the time on YouTube, to Google's mobile friendly, uh, mobile only outstream video offering. Um, but you know, again, all these choices, which are better for some formats, how much ad dollars should we be allocating to YouTube versus Instagram versus Facebook, and of course versus Twitter, Thanks to the mind-numbing frenzy of partisan politics out of Washington, D.C., that is certainly a highly publicized channel. But whether it has the kind of daily and chronic use rate that we need, lifted by all that publicity, is, uh, is a question. And so uh, we'll attempt to answer that for you today, which, uh, you know, whether Twitter is viable, and if so, by which formats and demos. And in addition to profiling Nielsen respondents and sharing some listener perceptions, ranking marketing channels, digital behavior, we're going to update you on smart speaker trends. Now, I know we sometimes have to share some bad news about some secular declines for our industry, but this is one area that represents a huge opportunity. And so we're going to end this presentation, no matter what ugliness we have to share with you, on a positive note. This is our marketing today, but we're not going to jam a whole bunch of new voodoo products and solutions down your throats. We hope this is this kind of free sample of our knowledge of uh, or the space and our willingness to commit our own resources to staying on top of trends is, um, is the confidence building that you need so, so that should the time arise in the fall or next year or at your next gig, that if we can be of service, uh, that you'll call us. So that's why we're doing this today. You'll be on mute uh, for the duration of the presentation, but we understand some of this data might uh, uh, peak some questions. Uh, so our producer, Jake, will troll the chats. We'll troll you, just the chats. And uh, so feel free to chime in whenever you see a slide that uh, uh, that has some data that spurs a question and we'll get to it. So truly dense half hour awaits. I've already overstayed my welcome. So let me turn things over to Lee Jacobs and Rating Prospect Study 12. Thanks very much, Mike. Uh, many of you, that I'm, as I'm looking down the uh, list of attendees have been uh, set through these presentations before. This is our 12th. 3,049 persons, 14 to 54 across all PPM markets. We do that proportional to market population, so there are more respondents from New York and LA than there are perhaps from uh, uh, from Portland, Oregon, uh, but they are proportional to market size. They are weighted to total population of that entire PPM market pool for gender, age, and ethnicity. We conduct all of our research uh, using compensated online sample, so we've got willing participants, and we were in the field back uh, in June just a month and some ago. And so up at the top, we love ratings like these. Uh, we do these studies in part to inform ourselves about what's going on with the people, the special breed, who are likely to participate with Nielsen. Uh, we are in the PPM markets, but we also ask a set of questions to identify those who are likely or the type of person would be likely to keep a, uh, a diary as well. Uh, and we'll call them PPM and diary yes for this purpose. And in this latest study, we're introducing a couple of new subgroups. Those who would likely play the Nielsen PPM or diary game and they spend at least an hour a day with terrestrial radio. In other words, the type of people within the Nielsen samples who have the potential to give your station the biggest lift. We call them New Voodoo PPM 60s and New Voodoo Diary 60s, meaning they listen at least 60 minutes a day. And some things have been true since we started conducting these studies back in 2011. Married people and people with children at home over-index. They likely over-represent themselves in uh, Nielsen samples. So those are why those numbers are up over 100, the uh, married people and the people with children, compared to those who are single or those who don't have children at home. That's always been true. This, however, is a change. Household income has been shifting. When we started doing these studies, the predicted Nielsen sample performance across household incomes favored that middle category, the 50 to 90K household income range, and shoulders drooping below and above that group. 
But in mid-2018, with the economy going pretty well, we theorized more folks are back in better paying jobs. And so we've seen the indices shifting upwards and favoring households 90K and above. And that raises new questions for us concerning interest levels. If maybe mom and dad are now both back to work in pretty decent jobs and there's more money in the household, is that going to change how they feel about different pricing, their interest in different types of pricing and different prize levels? And we're already working on the questionnaire that we'll field early next year to try to get at those answers. So when we look at uh, the ratings likelies, we'll find out that they're likely to be pretty heavy smartphone users. They over-index or having their noses in their phones at least four hours a day. So that's a lot of screen time to try to get in front of them and bend their behavior in the direction that we'd like to have it bent. Now, it won't shock you that these radioactive, if you will, uh, ratings likely respondents are great radio users. Here I'm showing percentages who listen to these various types of terrestrial at least 30 minutes a day. And you see the lift among the likely ratings respondents, 39% for FM radio for a half hour day across the total sample. That jumps to 52% for likely PPM respondents or 59% for likely diary respondents. So we've asked for years at the bottom of that funnel after we identify we have a set of four questions apiece that qualify people as likely PPM or likely diary responders. Now we say, which of these things would influence your participation? And we offer them about a dozen different foils. And what always rises up to the top is money and prizes, because Nielsen does offer prizes for your participation, particularly in PPM these days. So we took a different tack this time around. We asked past meter participants, we asked them why they did it. We found 29 very, uh, very high confidence past meter participants, and we said, so what made you decide to participate? And here are their answers in their own words. And if you don't like going through all the, their own words, you can look at the little uh, chart that I've prepared there in the lower right. Two-thirds of them talked about money. About a seventh, 14%, talked about pricing. And pricing does matter in that methodology because in PPM, uh, they're offering national kinds of contests among panelists to get them to stay in the panel, to get them to take their meters out, particularly at times when Nielsen has trouble getting compliance. And there are other people who... Say they want to make sure that a station they like is in the top rank or they can make a difference with the ratings. And there are other things that play in. But largely, we're talking about a population, and increasingly, by the way, a population who are motivated by the dollars. So how do we get our messages in front of them? Uh, which channels are going to be most effective? Mike talked about this up at the top. Here's how it stack ranks in mid-2018. And these are the much shortened uh, labels for each of these lines, but we described ads on websites in some detail, or what you'd get as a postcard or maybe a you know, pretty flyer or a uh, you know, piece that would come in the mail, or ads you see in social media channels, and we enumerated them, or outdoor billboards like that, TV, smartphone apps. This is a new category down there below search engines because those are showing up. It's kind of a subset of social media. Those are those videos that we described that people see in their social media feeds and uh, videos play, but you don't necessarily hear the sound. And uh, so they pay attention to those. Email, radio, and video on demand like Hulu, et cetera, is down there at the bottom of this ranking currently. You'll note that 14 to 24 is are harder to connect with overall and particularly in an inefficient to get to them via direct mail, as Mike points out. They can live their entire lives without needing to go to a mailbox. They get all their bills through uh, electronic channels. They probably don't have need to go to a mailbox. Probably no big shock that if you're a heavy FM radio user, you're that top quintile over two hours a day, they pay attention to ads. They're media savvy. They swim in the media. So they pay particular attention to lots of different ad channels, including our own. Those are the people who are most likely uh, to be impacted by your promos most quickly. So we can't recommend direct mail as a tactic to stations heavily targeting under age 25, and you can see the performance, however, of direct mail for these PPM likelies as you get up over age 25. Pretty strong, even at people 18 to 34, but that younger side of 14 to 24, the 14 to 17s, they're pretty much uh, immune to direct mail, if you will. 
And rounding out the top four, you've got social media and billboards there as well. You see the big depth for these channels among our PPM 60s, those heavy listeners who would likely uh, end up playing the Nielsen game if offered. The numbers look similar among the diary group, and those two uh, groups of respondents overlap somewhat, but there are some subtle differences, and so if you're uh, your station, your responsibilities are primarily diary. You'll want to pay attention particularly to those, uh, to those pages as we go through the rest of these data. So we started comparing notes at New Voodoo on things we'd overheard regular people, non-radio folks, saying about radio stations. And we started wondering, are those isolated perceptions or do a lot of people think that way? So we scripted them as agree-disagree statements to see how many would agree with these ideas? Like this one. Stations only pretend to give away money. Overall, about a quarter agree with that idea. Agreement rises to about 40% among likely ratings participants. Not surprising. We've had about half the likely ratings participants in our past studies agree that most station contests are rigged, and it underscores our belief that radio needs to go the extra mile with on-air promos and social media assets to get the word out about winners. After all, people who don't think your contest is legit are far less likely to participate and even less likely uh, to have their behavior modified the way you would like to have it uh, be uh, modified. So 31%, uh, heading for a third, agreed with this statement. There's no one in the studio at most of the radio stations you hear. They're automated most of the time. That's something that you can address in your programming if you are uh, boxed or uh, pre-recorded or automated during part of your day. Uh, there are obviously tricks and games you can play. There are things you can do to make that talent presentation sound more live, more relevant, more local, and try to beat back that that uh, rather cynical uh, perception. Stations don't really take requests because they never answer the phone, respond to email, text, or social media. That plays hand in glove with the last uh, statement that we showed you, and the numbers rise up a little bit higher here, over a third overall, and heading for half among the uh, either of the ratings likely groups, and fully half among the ratings likely groups at 18 to 44, and heading for three and five among the 14 to 24s. And that's something that you can address by having systems in place that somebody somewhere picks up a phone if a listener calls that number or responds to email. Who's charged with doing that? What latitude do they have in getting back to, to your listeners? Who's going to handle text? Who's going to respond or, or comment uh, back to comments made in your social media posts? These are important factors in 2018. This one came from uh, my own experience, heard a bunch of a uh, group of millennials at a family gathering agreeing that radio had a variety problem, and they finally concluded, without asking me, uh, that radio does this as very narrow playlists so they can save money on music licensing fees. And I wondered how many people would agree with that. And it does have that younger component, particularly among the, so the uh, PPM likely or diary likely folks, but that spreads to about half through any of these uh, ratings likely groups who believe that there's that must be why there's a problem with radio station playlist variety. Or how about this one? Radio stations mostly play the songs that music companies pay them to play. You'll notice that there's no real demographic tilt to that one at all. It kind of goes all the way across the demos, cleared on up into uh, 3554. It's that the music companies are what causes that. And we think that's in part because it's a black box. Radio stations generally don't talk very much about uh, how their songs or playlists get put together, despite the fact that because of uh, Apple Music, we know what a playlist is in 2018. That's become a consumer word, but we never talk about how our songs get collected or uh, selected, rather. Uh, and that's something that we could change. Or if you're launching something new and you want to take on an established competitor, the chances are they never talk about how their music gets selected. So you can go after it and paint the picture that, yeah, it's, it's their playlist stinks because it's the record companies paying them to play whatever they, they want them to. Have you ever tuned into a radio station because of any of these things? We asked these questions about a number of different items. In the past, we've uh, included uh, severe weather. We've included commercial free hours. We clip those out this time because they always ride up to the top. But in terms of trying different tactics that might work to get lift, 
a friend said they'd heard a song you might like on that station. Word of mouth still works in 2018. It's still important and potent. Station posted something funny or interesting uh, on Facebook. It would need to be something that related to you. And we did specify Facebook, so you see how 14 to 24 is drop down because they're not as uh, not as frequently on Facebook as older demos are these days. You heard that a show host or DJ said something that caused to stir. That would stir up some interest, so to speak. Uh, you saw a contest advertised in social media. That has some lift. Billboards for the station. Sure, there's that. Uh, or friend or family member dedicating a song to you, shout outs. Those things still have lift and you can amplify that in 2018 by being able to uh, pin back a digital copy of that dedication or that shout out to that person in their social media feed or in their email. And by the way, if you can get your uh, talent doing it on video, that's something that that person might then share to their social media and get you uh, a, a slightly wider circle. Numbers are similar, but they change around as we look at the psychographic that would likely play the diary game to keep a one-week pamphlet as opposed to be tethered to a meter for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. But there's lift here as well. Uh, the dedication shout-out notion goes up among 14 to 24 likely diary keepers. The shout-out still has about a fifth or so. If you get over to the uh, diary 60s, those heavy listeners, that's heading for a quarter that say they would be impacted. Or just something interesting and relevant to their lives that uh, they want to share or talk about on Facebook has some lift too. And speaking of Facebook, uh, we would be, uh, you know, we do these in part twice a year so that we can look into the social media lens and see what's going on within that group. And in the wake of the Cambridge Analytica flap, uh, we wanted to look at trust. How much do you trust these services to keep your personal information safe? If we were looking at trust numbers on a 10-point scale for uh, the news that you have on a, a news-oriented radio station with any of your within a cluster, we'd see the, these numbers up in the 60s or 70s. But people are pretty uh, skeptical about any of these social media channels actually keeping their personal information safe. It's a little bit higher, a little bit stronger for the Google YouTube ecosystem, and then it drops down in Facebook, which might have been the standard bearer before the Cambridge Analytica flap. We don't know. We hadn't looked at it before, but that's now kind of a dismal 27%. We also wondered, do people perceive these platforms getting better or worse so we asked the question is it getting better or gotten worse compared to a year ago so here you're looking at net numbers better minus worse and I'm expecting to see 20 points to the good within among the populations who are using any of these channels uh, it sh you should feel like it's gotten better the people are making improvements and so you see nice healthy numbers for YouTube that's a healthy channel Instagram has lovely numbers in the demographics where it's active and getting oomph. Pinterest, yeah, that's a 21, the 24, 21 across uh, women over 18. So that's pretty healthy. Twitter's got some resonance about around men 18 to 34. Snapchat, you know, guys 16, uh, 14 to 24, eh, it's got a little bit of lift, but not so much among uh, among their counterparts, the women, uh, 14 to 24. And then there's Facebook at the bottom of that table, just flat. And younger demos saying, nah, it got worse. Okay, so that's bad. So then what's it look like in terms of usage? This is daily usage of these social media channels. And Facebook's hold is now 14 to 24 persons. Back uh, when we were in the field in January, we'd seen the hole at females 20, 14 to 24, but not at men 14 to 24, and now that's come and stalked them. So it's got a hole on both sides at uh, persons 14 to 24. Instagram looking pretty strong at uh, 14 to 34 indeed, maybe even 14 up to 44. And you can see how that's mostly blunted uh, the growth of Snapchat which still has its own constituency at younger women, but doesn't seem to be growing at the rate it had just uh, a year and a half, two years ago. Among heavy FM users, that top quintile of FM users, Facebook is perennially on top and is here too, although YouTube not too far behind. Instagram, uh, Snapchat a little bit smaller, Twitter at about 40%. But when I show this to you through the lens of format P1 groups, and not necessarily through uh, TSL. 
But among these people who were P1s for any of these formats, you'll see where Twitter really comes into its own, and that's among spoken word, talk radio or sports radio P1s, info junkies, if you will. They also say they're checking out Snapchat. Instagram has a constituency there. And you can see how well per performing Instagram is among rhythmic CHR P1s and urban P1s as well. If we look at this through the lens of likely PPM uh, participators, the likely PPM folks, you see uh, Facebook and YouTube nearly tied overall, though Facebook has that hole at 14 to 24, but it has huge performance among heavy listeners, people who give uh, terrestrial radio a lot of TSL, as do uh, both Instagram and Twitter uh, have some resonance there as well. Similar looking numbers, uh, if you were paying more attention to diary markets than you would be to PPM. Looks like this. With Facebook up on top among the diary 60s and then YouTube and then Instagram and then Twitter. First time ever this time around, we also asked about your favorite social media platform. Just a few years ago, maybe you were using Facebook and maybe one other that you tried or maybe you had Facebook and YouTube and you were considering playing with one of the others. But now, especially among younger demos, we're seeing people who are using many of them. So we thought to start tracking, what's your favorite? Turns out your favorite is likely to be uh, Facebook still. YouTube, though, has a huge swath across particularly younger men. And then Instagram has a growing swath among uh, younger adults, but particularly right now younger women. And we'll be eager to track this in the coming months. And as Mike promised you, we wanted to get the latest intel on smart speakers. What's going on there? Now, we'd seen a bump up. We started tracking this last summer, and we saw the numbers rise after uh, the holidays this past year. Uh, so when we were in the field in January, we saw nice growth, and we thought, well, that'll probably flatten out when we go in the field in the summer, and then it'll come back up when we go in the field next January. Uh, strong sales across the holidays. We were wrong. These numbers keep growing. Uh, and if you pay attention to what people talk about at parties and family events, they start talking about how, yeah, I got one of this. It's pretty cool. I do this, that, and the other thing with it. And at the low price point, particularly for the, for the small units, uh, the sales are pretty strong. So these numbers are growing. Heck, even the, the Apple HomePod, which was not even available, we were in the field back in January, has popped in with a pretty nice initial entry number. So these numbers are growing and rather rapidly. And if I can get your attention about this, if you drill it down to the people who really call it, you know, create the ratings, the people who are likely to show up in the Nielsen samples, they're on board with these devices. They are people who like to listen to things. We've seen for years that as it applies to streaming, and that will be coming up on our next webinar in, the, in September, these are people who like to listen to stuff. They listen to a lot of FM. They might listen to a lot of Pandora and Spotify as well. So it makes sense that, yeah, they are, they are early adopters uh, as it applies to uh, smart speakers. We also track where do they have them in their homes. Uh, as it's been to this point, uh, living room and bedroom had been vying for number one at about 40%, but this time around, as the numbers grow, people are reallocating some and placing them in primarily the bedroom. The plurality end up in the bedroom, and we think that's an incredibly exciting development. That's a huge opportunity for radio, because there used to be the behavior that someone's clock radio would go on, in the morning, wake them up playing your morning show so they would get you know, inoculated with that and then transfer that into the car as they headed out for their day. And now we have an opportunity back in the bedroom even as people have stopped using clock radios or wake up to their smartphone doing something or another. Well, they could in fact wake up to their smart speaker, but even more easily they could remember but you could remind them to turn the morning show on in the bedroom while they're getting ready. And if you're not sure if they're understanding that they can listen to FM radio on their smart speaker, here's some confidence for you. The number two activity that they say they've tried doesn't mean they do it every day, but they can do it. They know this is available. The number two thing they know they can do is listen to a local FM station. And we think that's pretty exciting. 
Uh, and in fact, if you drill it down to the people who are likely to show up in any of these ratings samples, the numbers go up even further, heading toward a half or a little over a half. That's exciting, uh, you know, exciting news from our perspective, and we think a huge opportunity for radio. And so that's a lot of data. I promised to uh, get it done at the bottom of the hour, and we have just hit it. And of course, um, that was a lot to ingest. So um, we won't be sending out this study uh, to anyone that requests it. However, um, within, I think it's 24 hours, it might even be within an hour of shutting down the webinar, you will get a video recording uh, sent to the email address you used to register uh, for the webinar. So if Lee went just a little too fast on a couple of those slides and you missed your format or your demo, you'll be able to uh, parse the data more closely. You can join us on another webinar. Now, we did promise that we would um, drill down or offer some extra color on any questions that have come in, and Jake has been busy mining the chats. Jake? Yep, thanks for your questions. Um, first one is, uh, you covered marketing channels, um, but what about telemarketing? Um, they've seen a lot of our emails touting uh, recent client successes, so uh, they just want to know where, where does that rank on the list? Yeah, and it's really not appropriate to put telemarketing because it's not really a ch an ad channel you pay attention to. So we actually dedicated a very significant portion of our January study to at work listening. And there is a webinar uh, recorded uh, with fairly up to, I mean, it's 2018 data that you can go uh, to the webinar section of our website, newvoodoo.com, uh, to get a deep dive. But I will give you a few kind of uh, big headlines from that. Um, the at work opportunity is where it's at for telemarketing. Uh, landlines at the home, 40% have been detethered. It's as high as 60% in the younger demos. And between the call blocking that people can use and the, um, and the do not call list, you know, we've done this research until we're blue in the face. We estimate that you can only successfully reach legally maybe 20% and in more cases like 10% of the likely Nielsen respondents uh, who would listen to your radio station or a competitor who um, who would accept a diary or meter. And you know you have to make a lot of phone calls uh, to get through to somebody who, who answers. So from a cost perspective, we just don't even believe in selling that anymore. So for us, telemarketing is all about the workplace where none of those problems exist. There are no do not call lists. Most businesses answer the phone because they have to deal with customers. And we find that uh, receptivity to phone calls in the workplace uh, as long as you're offering cash and not wasting someone's time uh, with something superfluous, um, that that uh, that there's a high accept rate. In fact, we did the research on it uh, just to support what we see in data for clients every day. That of all the things that a station might place a phone call, um, you know, to somebody to to offer or to explain new format, new morning show, uh, cash uh, is the number one reason people would think a telemarketing call from a radio station is a good thing. The other reason that at work um, penetration is so important, it's not so much that uh, you can reach uh, a high percentage of audience that uh, listens to radio, because in fact, only about a third of any research sample that we've ever you, you know, talked to, 14 to 54, uh, has told us that they listen to any audio entertainment in the background at all while they work. So it's not a big number, but the deal is that when you find someone who listens at work, 70% of those people, uh, I should say 70% of the people who uh, give the highest level of time spent listening, an hour or more a day to terrestrial radio, are uh, the, the listening is accounted for because they're listening at work among other places. So it's a huge opportunity to unlock uh, time spent listening. So while we couldn't rate it on a com continuum with residential direct mail and, uh, uh, and digital and the other marketing channels you see, um, it's a higher probability of finding a panelist, a higher probability of unlocking a TSL. There's the viral component, the, the exposure to coworkers. So we love packaging uh, office telemarketing for any station that's targeting 25 or above. In fact, one of the, I guess this is kind of the final data point I'll give you, is that 2534 is the number one at work demo cell for, at, for in office listening. That's the good news. The bad news is more than half of all demos at work are listening to something other than terrestrial radio. Um, uh, so we're up against more than just our, our AM or FM competitors. We're up against uh, 
Spotify and Pandora and iHeartMedia.com and Amazon On Demand and Apple Music and all, all those other platforms. But these people are contest susceptible, particularly the ones that are, you know, that um, that say yes to Nielsen. Uh, so bribes, uh, you know, the telemarketing phone calls and bribes that can get some of the change some behavior in office, uh, at least over the short period of time. Great. Uh, next question is based on the on the research we just showed. Um, should we start thinking about shying away from advertising on Facebook? Can we take that one, Lee? Yeah, I think that's got you written all over it. So the answer is I would diversify, but you cannot argue with the, and we're just showing the daily use for clients. We show some other uh, statistics, including the chronic users and the, you know, the, the four time a day, the 10 time a day plus, and we correlate that to PPM. Um, so I would say that Facebook should not be discounted. However, you have to realize that when you combine Facebook and Instagram, the unduplicated daily reach of the PPM or diary 60s that we showed you is about 99%. And of the marketplace in general, the unduplicated reach, and we've done this, we just did this study post Facebook Armageddon is still at 95%. But we would highly recommend mixing YouTube and Google Display Network in with a Facebook, Instagram buy, among other channels, but that to us is the foundational package uh, for use. And there's very specific ways we buy YouTube, very specific ways we buy Facebook according to you know what type of objective we've got. We can do everything from virtual outdoor campaigns on mobile phones to data capture campaigns. And each media mix needs to re be reflective of the specific uh, contest tactics. But that's where I'm at. I think YouTube is a huge channel and a missed opportunity for those not using it in any demo. Great. Uh, the last question is, um, with the perception about radio stations only pretending to give away money, um, does that suggest that um, radio stations should, should start de-emphasizing contests? No. Oh my gosh, no. Uh, quite the opposite. But we think emphatically that it means that radio stations need to have a strong plan for how are we going to communicate that people really win. Um, you know, devote some social media uh, weight to that. Uh, winner videos, winner audio, uh, some postings on social media so that it gets outside your queue. But by the way, make sure that that's an important component of what you're presenting on here. People who like contests like to know that people are winning. That gives them greater confidence that hey, I have a chance at this. I could actually win. So we don't think it indicates that we should pull back from contests at all, but rather that we need to, uh, I'll use the term, double down on post-promotion, on showing that people win. Yeah, and we're going to actually dive into contesting again because I think that um, what's going on in the world outside of our little cocoon is that has got some application. I think that you know there's so many data points that we've collected in the last year that suggest that people are kind of thinking some of the tried and true ways radio operates is a little bit of quote unquote fake news. And there are ways for you to play offense to exploit those. And there's things you have to think about, I think, to shore up um, any Q4 contest uh, that you've got coming up. So if you're a local contest operator, we're gonna share with you some data and some tricks about how to potentially reposition negatively national contests. If you're a national contest participant, don't lose hope. There's some promising data that people may not be on to uh, the multi-city aspect of your promotion. And there's ways for you to really completely neutralize any of the downsides. So we'll get into all of that and share with you that actual data on the next webinar, right, which we call episode two. We're also do another deep dive into appointment times. Uh, and this time, instead of selecting a few different ways to describe select appointment times during the workday or, um, you know, random times, uh, you know, from during Radio Prime, we're going to pit all 12 hours of 6A to 7P or 13 hours, whatever that is, uh, radio uh, appointment times and let you know um, the best way to park them by format, by demo, um, by PPM and Diary 60. We'll also get into new music discovery. Now, whereas the smart speaker news was put a, put a smile on my face that finally there's a data point. The radio can 
get up off their rear end and go, you know, get an Alexa skill and start hammering uh, that u- new use case for radio. That's a game changer. Unfortunately, we're losing our position on the uh, new music discovery front. We'll get into what there's one channel that's now ahead of radio. Um, and there's a couple other ones threatening, but one that's non-terrestrial radio that's beating us. Uh, and finally, streaming. Uh, it's not just uh, digital platforms. It's not just terrestrial competitors. We've got Spotify, Pandora, and that's a really interesting battle. We'll get into all of that um, uh, next webinar as well. So a lot of good stuff coming up. And then, of course, there's a whole bunch of data from 2018 that's available right now on right. our Nanon website. Right, because this was a lot of data pretty quick that we just presented. You'll have an email, which will link you to uh, to a video recording of today's webinar. That'll be in your inbox pretty shortly. And if you'd like to spend the time to go through past webinars, they all live at nuvudu.com forward slash webinars, and soon there'll be uh, links up to register for episode two that Mike was just talking about. So uh, a lot of information uh, at the basis of uh, at, at the uh, a great deal of research time and, and money we've spent trying to help everybody become better broadcasters and do a better job uh, reaching people. We appreciate your attendance today. I really appreciate the attention you've given us.